A decade ago, the idea of taking a picture of a black hole would have been fanciful. It was pure speculation. But we dreamed, and now we've taken the first snapshot, we've taken the first data, and we're developing those data right now. You never quite know where your research is going to go or what the impact of your research is going to be, but it's the pursuit of mysteries, it's the pursuit of knowledge that is really the goal and really the key. And that, for me, is the passion. That's why I wake up in the morning. Please welcome Shep Doleman from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as they say, now for something completely different. <laughs> All right. uh, so black holes, for my money, are the most mysterious objects in the universe. But we have some idea of maybe what they look like. We've seen movies. This is a clip from the Interstellar movie. Uh, and they've swallowed spaceships and movies, planets, stars, both real stars and movie stars. I, I, I haven't seen Bruce Willis in a while. I'm sure he may have gone into one. Um, but a black hole forms when enough matter simply squeezes into a small enough volume that its self-gravity cannot prevent itself from squeezing into an infinite point of density, right? And around that infinite density point is the event horizon. That's the point where gravity is so strong that even light can't escape. So gravity, so nature knowing that this is something of an abomination shields it from our view in some kind of cosmic censorship. Now, if we could make a, um, if we could test Einstein's theory in the one place where it might break down, we'd go to, uh, we'd look for evidence in a galaxy like this. This is an optical um, view of one of the nearby galaxies. And in the optical light, it doesn't, looks pretty normal. But in radio waves, you see something really extraordinary. Now this should knock your socks off because these are cosmic blow torches screaming from the center of a galaxy. Uh, near the speed of light, and if the Earth were in one of these jets, we'd be toasted, right? So it's a good thing that our galaxy is not active in this same way, but the only thing that can cause this kind of energy output is matter falling onto a supermassive black hole. This is some of the best indirect evidence we have, although in my family, the fact that socks disappear from the dryer occasionally, <laughs> it seems like it's proof enough that monsters exist uh, in the cosmos. But what the Event Horizon Telescope is aiming to do is take the first picture of a black hole to see if we can test Einstein's theories in the one place where they might break down. And to set the stage, let's talk about Newton for a moment. His ideas of gravity held sway for hundreds of years. They accurately predicted the trajectory of cannonballs and of weights dropping from towers, but they did not, curiously enough, predict the orbit of Mercury, which got a mysterious kick every time it went around the sun. So Q. Einstein, who came up with an entirely different geometric way of understanding gravity. Instead of objects interacting with forces between them, a mass would deform space-time like a ball settling into a rubber sheet. An object would move through this space-time, around this rubber sheet, as though they were attracted to the original mass. Now this immediately resolved the Mercury question, which is great, great news. But such revolutionary concepts require very good evidence. So in 1919, astronomers went to, uh, off the coast of Africa and to uh, Brazil to look at the total solar eclipse because Einstein predicted that gravity would also bend light. And if you looked at stars at the limb of the sun, they would appear to be in a different position just for a small window of time from where they normally were. And in fact, this is exactly what they saw. Using the best astronomical instruments of, the, of their time, they were able to see this difference and it matched precisely what Einstein predicted. So overnight, Einstein became a household name, and uh, we were off and running thinking about gravity in a whole different way. And with the Event Horizon Telescope Project that is based at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, we're trying to take the first image of a black hole to see what we might see. Now, the best case for doing that is the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, really in our own backyard. You see here streamers of hot gas descending into the center of our galaxy, but if you were to zoom in a few thousand times, our optical friends see stars orbiting an unseen mass. So these are, these are real stars orbiting something that weighs four million times what our sun does at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This should really knock your socks off. I mean, this is, you don't, you don't normally see stars being tossed around like planets. Now, if you were to zoom in even further, what does Einstein predict we should see? 
well, this is a simulation made by one of the people in our team, you wind up seeing the hot gas swirling around the black hole, which is heated to hundreds of billions of degrees by the crushing gravity. And you see a circular feature here, which is really interesting. We call it the silhouette of the black hole. And it's formed because light is orbiting the black hole in circular fashion, and it lights up this ring. And 100 years ago, Einstein perfectly predicted the size and shape of that ring. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to image this silhouette. Now, the problem is that that silhouette is exceedingly small. Even though the black hole weighs four million times what our sun does, that silhouette is equivalent to trying to count the dimples on a golf ball in Los Angeles if you're standing here in this auditorium. So we can't use a normal telescope like this one because the, the size of the objects you can see is directly related to the size of the mirror. So here's what we do with the Event Horizon Telescope. Imagine taking a ball-peen hammer. I'm horrified I'm even suggesting this and smashing that mirror into shards and scattering those shards all over the face of the Earth. You'd wind up with an Earth-sized telescope with holes in between, but if you could link all those shards together, you'd have an Earth-sized telescope, which is what we need to make this image. So in the Event Horizon Telescope, whoop, in the Event Horizon Telescope, we do this, but not with shards, but with radio dishes all over the globe. And we link them with atomic clocks that lose only one second every 10 million years. When all of these dishes swivel to look at the center of our galaxy at the same time, we recreate a virtual dish. But we have only a handful of dishes. How do we fill in the spaces in between? Well, the answer is right under your feet. The Earth rotates. And during the course of a night of observing, all the links that you see here in red with the telescopes weave together a network that fills in that virtual mirror. And after a night of observing, you really get a network and web that creates the full global telescope with which we can make that image. Now, each of these sites looks at the galactic center and records all the data on a bank of hard disk drives. And they have to be flown back in a 747. And the reason we do that is because no internet is fast enough. When we take data at the South Pole, it would take 25 years for all of that data to get back. You can't beat the bandwidth of a 747 packed with disk drives. <laughs> so, to look, look, to look at these extreme environments, we go to some pretty extreme places ourselves. To make these observations, we have to go to the highest and driest sites on Earth. So from California to mountaintops in Arizona, uh, to extinct volcanoes on the top of Hawaii, uh, to mountains in Europe, and even down to the South Pole in Greenland, we go to very challenging environments to make these observations. So for example, here are some of our coworkers at the South Pole. And I know for a fact they're working in minus 40 degrees Celsius temperatures there. And for those of you who need a conversion, it's really easy. It's also minus 40 Fahrenheit. <laughs> uh, very, very challenging conditions there. Uh, this is a new telescope that we've just commissioned in Greenland. And the conditions there are, are equally harsh. But in addition, you have to watch out for the alerts that polar bears are walking through the facility occasionally. So make sure you check your email before you walk out the door. Um, and this is the crown jewel of the Event Horizon Telescope, ALMA, high in the Atacama Plain in Chile. And here, at 16,500 feet, you need supplementary oxygen to work, or else you're susceptible to what we call summit moments. And by summit, I mean the top of a mountain, where the air is so thin that all of a sudden you'll ask yourself, what am I doing? Why am I here? Right? So uh, these are very, very challenging conditions. And I spent actually a year in Antarctica. I know how hard it is to do these kinds of observations uh, when something breaks and there isn't a radio shack right next door. You get very, very uh, creative. So we started with some big questions. Uh, could we see the invisible? Uh, can we build the Event Horizon Telescope? And the answer is yes, we can. We've taken our first observations and now we're crunching through the data. And I hope to have something to report to everyone here soon. Uh, but why are we doing this? How would it change the here and now? A way to answer that question is to imagine what Einstein might have said. He would have had no answer. Because in 1915, nothing in our day-to-day -day experience used his general relativity and his corrections to Newton's gravity. But look in your purse, look in your pocket. We now have something that we use every day that requires his theory. The GPS that's on your phone uses the fact that clocks in orbit tick faster than clocks on the surface of the ground just because of gravity. If we didn't make that correction, we'd be miles off. Right? So imagine going now and asking Einstein, I like to do this, imagine talking to Einstein and saying, Professor Einstein, 100 years from now, there'll be satellites, and they'll talk to your smartphone, 
and they'll be able to tell you within meters where you are anywhere on the surface of the earth. And he'd be so excited, he'd say, what's a smartphone? <laughs> right? I mean, he would have no idea what you were remotely talking about. Sometimes it takes that long for basic research to come to fruition into our everyday lives. So at SAO, we just love the details. We're kind of nerds at heart in a certain way, but we love making things work. But we also love the mysteries of the universe. We love coming up against infinity. And really, that's what makes us curious humans. It, the timelines are very interesting. In politics, it's the next election cycle. For business, it's the quarterly bottom line. But at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, we're playing the long game, hundreds of years in some cases, because we know that's how long it takes sometimes for basic research, which is never a bad investment, which never goes out of style, to come into our everyday lives. Thank you. <laughs>